Uh, I want us to recite Surah Fatiha together as an opener. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Shaitan Rajim, Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Arahmani Rahim, Maliki Rahim, Maliki Rahim, Nabudu Waya, 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 uh, please, before we start, I want us to have a, a slight more time to a short reflection on the ongoing Palestine genocide and to offer our prayers. Uh, I want us to think about it generally. What does it mean to everyone of us personally? And what are we doing to, to stop the genocide? I mean, in our little ways in our dua, in our condemnation. And um, are, we reflected, uh, are we reflecting on the inward meaning, the spiritual reflections of what this means to, to us generally in context of the Muslim Ummah generally, the state of the Muslim Ummah. And uh, we should not stop praying for them and for every other people and Muslims facing uh, this oppression around the world. Um, may Allah grant them relief and victory. We say, as we are back tomorrow. Now, after saying that, so I want to welcome every one of us uh, to, on behalf of International Students of Islamic Psychology in Nigeria chapter, to our bi weekly public lectures on mental health discussion in context of Islam. So, here are the basic rules. You, you are free to put on your videos and it's encouraged. Although if you think that the video will maybe because of data and where you are, it's okay, you can put it on. But please keep your mic muted while the lecture is on, which I'm also going to adhere to, please. Um, you don't have to record. So inshallah, after the event, we'll try to make it happen today, inshallah. Otherwise, in less than a week, we're going to share the video. So you don't have to record the... And if you need the slides uh, for the presentation, you can always contact me directly, or I'm going to send some links for the WhatsApp groups that you can ask directly on the provide, uh, inshallah. So there will be a question and answer session, as already stated. So you, you don't have to interrupt the lecturer. So there are two options. Either you put in your questions in the chat box, or you uh, wait. After the lecture, you're going to raise up your hand and you'll be given the opportunity to ask the question directly to the, to the lecturer, inshallah. And uh, I'm, I'm going to put some links, uh, WhatsApp links, okay, as, as uh, the lecturer goes on, in case you want to know more about the events, the activities of ICIB, uh, International Center of Islamic Psychology worldwide, and also Nigerian chapter. Some of the things we are doing, you'll get updates. So I'm going to share some WhatsApp link in between the lecture, inshallah. So, Without further delay, um, I would like to to, to welcome up our, our lecturer, but uh, quickly to recite to read his profile. So I want one of our uh, coordinators to do that for us in person of Sister Hanifa. This Hanifa. Uh, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam to everyone. No. We can hear you, Ms. Okay. I'll be reading the full profile of Dr. Tadjidin Abiola. Dr. Tadjidin Abiola, MBBS, MSc in Psychotherapy and FMC Psych, is an accomplished mental health specialist who has dedicated his career to addiction prevention, mental health promotion, and public health initiatives on a global scale. With his extensive background in psychiatry and psychotherapy, is committed to combating addiction and improving mental well-being worldwide. Currently serving as the head of clinical services at the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital Kaduna in Nigeria, Dr. Abiola oversees the effective operations of the hospital and provides specialized medical psychotherapy services. His research on effective intervention strategies contribute to evidence-based practices 
in managing psycho psychological trauma and preventing addiction. In his roles as the head of the scientific board and national secretary of the Green Crescent Health Development Initiative, GHI, Dr. Abiela spearheads addiction prevention programs and collaborates with multidisciplinary teams to address addiction related issues in communities. He also leads nationwide efforts to combat addiction and develop capacity building programs for community groups focused on youth development. Dr. Abiala actively coordinates collaborative efforts among local and international medical professionals through the IMAN Addiction Working Group. He fosters partnership and advocates for preventive measures to address addiction challenges globally. His academic achievements include curriculum development and training programs in medical psychotherapy and addiction prevention education. Dr. Abiola is a prolific author with, numer with numerous publications on addiction prevention and psycho psychosocial intervention. He has authored a book exploring the link between entrepreneurship and addiction and contributed chapters to an upcoming undergraduate textbook on psychiatry. Dr. Abiela has secured grants and currently collaborates as a co-principal investigator on, on the Building the Childhood Epilepsy Treatment Gap in Africa, Bridge in Brackets project, which aims to foster international partnership and improve addiction care. He's passionate about sharing knowledge and has, developed, and has developed, delivered over 22 public lectures globally, advocating for addiction prevention and mental health. For more information about Dr. Tajuddin Abiola, please refer to his research gates, LinkedIn, and Google Scholar profile. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the incitation. Okay, so uh, I would like to invite Dr. Tajina Biola now, if he's available to commence the lecture. Bismillah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So no, you have no, my slide is... the lecture, right? Sharing the no yes. no problem from yes. Okay. Yes. You can see my slide. I yes, guess. we can see. Can you see my slide? Yes. <coughs> yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can see. Okay. What I see. Thank you. Bye, doctor. Bye. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I was willing to share one or two similar reminders with uh, inshallah, I hope to briefly talk about uh, this topic, reappraising mental health through the lens of Islamic psychology, a global guide for mental health practitioners. And uh, inshallah, to accomplish this, I will be going through the following set of objectives. I'll provide a prelude to what I hope to talk about. That's an introduction to it. Then talk about uh, the limit of the mainstream approaches that we have now. Uh, what are the sources for the alternative? Give an overview of uh, Islamic psychology. Then uh, how do you apply Islamic tenet to mental health? Provide some common ground between Islamic psychology and uh, the common mainstream that we have, and see some clinical utility, which we serve as a global guide. Uh, then we'll read some other conclusion, question and answer. Okay. This, can you put on to your start with? Oh, you're not comfortable with that? It's okay. okay. I don't know. Can you okay, see please my put it off. It's going, if it's going to affect your ne network, you can put it off. All right. Please go ahead. Okay. Is, is everything okay like this? Uh, we can't see you. But if, if it's, you okay. can put it My off, no problem, on. so that we don't obstruct the, the flow. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. My, My video is on, but I don't know. Maybe afterwards okay. it will show. Okay. okay. Let me continue. 
Okay. Uh, to to uh, continue my uh, talk about just to give us a, a prelude to what mental health to appreciate mental health I think one of the way to look at is to look at what are the founding sciences uh, to mental health and looking at it from broadly the mainstream mm -hmm. perspective there are three founding sciences to it the biological science the psychological science and the social sciences. In the biological science, in the current time, we talk more of neurosciences, which is how the brain functions and structures can be studied and see how that have implication to uh, how we understand, how we interpret and feel the external world, the internal world, and behave towards that. So the neurosciences uh, attempts to do that. And also one of the other things biological sciences also do is the me medication we prescribe. Uh, how those medication do impact people's behavior, either to bring about illness or health for the individual. And this plays some roles in terms of genetics, exploring hereditary issues when it comes to mental health. Uh, another major family science is psychological science. Uh, this typically starts as a philosophy where it could do to some research experimentation. We have a scientific background to it, and now we call it a biological science. And based on that, it tried to, yeah, it's, of course, psychology has so many branches, but the one that is relevant to mental health is called clinical psychology, which try to choose some clinical uh, theories, uh, interpretations, uh, paradigms, I try to address what mental health should be like and assess it and try to provide treatment through that mechanism. Another very important aspect when it comes to mental health is the social sciences. Uh, the social sciences, usually through the sociology and anthropology, they contributed uh, respectively by looking at how societal factors, the way the society is organized and how the structural, uh, cultural factors, which is anthropological issues there, all impact the individual's mental health processes. However, some of the missing elements in terms of the family science, which is acknowledged but often are silent about in the mainstream, are the cultural sensitivity of what is being presented. And this, uh, the way we understood mental health, are they culturally sensitive to other cultures across? Are they specific to it? And so all these affect and these are missing elements when it comes to mental health. And this I'll come to why some proponents are talking about a multicultural approach to mental health to provide, to assess, and to provide treatment. And also is the holistic approach, which is also missing. The mainstream try to find it, but it, it find it difficult to be able to provide a way to integrate holistic approach into the current paradigm of mental health. In the, from the mainstream perspective, especially when we look at what role spirituality should, pay, uh, should play in understanding mental health. Yes, there is a way to understand mental health from the mainstream perspective, but it's so limited and it's not well allowed capacity to be able to help individuals to be able to integrate it when it comes to treatment. And often the promotion of what you call the uh, uh, the uh, the, the, the aim to give to this as uh, faith-based uh, counselors now that leads to those pastoral counseling and all those things that those have to be developed in order to fill some of this gap and those uh, are the, some of the diseases. So this basically gives a very brief overview of what mental health so entails when we talk about it. And looking at it, I've tried to show that the family sciences, all this comes together to try to look at what the organ that the mental health is more worried about, which is the brain, and how the missing element are also contributing to affect the brain so that the way the brain interprets, understands, feels, and make individuals to behave, all these are working together to uh, bring about a change in this. Uh, the, the next slide uh, is, is talking about what are the current approaches that we have from the mental perspective. And the two approaches are usually existentialism and the mainstream uh, uh, approach. The mainstream uh, uh, comprises of so many theories that we may know as far as psychology is our cognitive behavioral 
there's the cognitive school, the behavioral school, the psychoanalytic school, and all those combined together, they form the mainstream now. The existentialism is the only one that still based its source on psychology, I mean, on philosophy. So existentialism is a, is a branch of a, a providing mental health care, but based on philosophical approaches. Uh, there are some experimental issues, but it's mainly from philosophy. And based on the philosophy that have come to also have its own uh, contribution to the mental well-being. Of, and that's why when it comes to issues of existential challenges about what is the meaning about life and pain and things like that, those are, but it's still missing in a way. And the existentialism and the mainstream seems to be working against one another. They seems to be pulling on the opposite direction. They are not finding a way to integrate themselves to work together for people who are, are be able to have opportunity to look at the two sides when it when, when, uh, comes to the uh, understanding and the application of some of the principles in these two main broad uh, fields or uh, paradigms that are trying to shape mental health globally. Uh, the, the next slide is trying to help us look as so, some of the distance that uh, is affecting, uh, that is, is looking at it, that those elements that we have understood, what are their limits as far as the mainstream mental health uh, paradigms are? What are their limits? And what are the underexplored, what are the underexplored uh, contribution that spirituality brought to them? Which is one of the reasons that we know the limitation of some of these uh, mainstream uh sciences that have found them like the biological sciences they are reductionist in nature they try to reduce everything about the complexity of human experience to so just uh uh what we commonly look at uh, what are changes in the brain what are neurotransmitters and the rest so usually try to limit things to that i talk about uh reductive issue maybe because so those are the way they look at it genetic factor, that's where you look at it. But it tries not to acknowledge that spirituality do play so it, especially when you look at meditation. They have a way they implant physiological changes in people. They also change brain structure too when people engage in them. And they contribute to reducing people who are going through stressful experience. And so this is telling all of a lot that reductionist way of looking at biological processes, which neuroscience is looking at mainly it has its limitation because it has come to deny some of the other aspects of it, like spiritual practices that can influence them. Uh, the other main element of mental health is psychological uh, sciences. And these generally are individual-centric approach because they, they are not collectivist in most of their, uh, the main theories that try to push and uh, pave a uh, way to the a way we understand, we assess, and we try to provide help for people suffering uh, in the psychological. Uh, so, uh, because these theories are so diverse, they become at times difficult to integrate them, to bring them. And at times, some of them are just more theoretical in nature. So, there is also difficulty in trying to bring those theoretical, those hypothetical things that have been said to find a practical application for them when it comes to applying them. But when we look at spirituality, we know one of the things that the current mainstream uh, in, uh, inclusion to the generations of how the mainstream scientists are growing is what is meaning generally in life. Meaning about this illness process, meaning about living, meaning about other men multiple lived experience of human beings. So what do they, do those many are? They are being interpreted also from this individualistic approach. And this brings a limitation to what uh, we expect a mentor should be able to do for individual because the human being is so broad, so culturally enriched that it has to have a more broader way to look at the experiences that it's going through so that it can be able to navigate, be able to... Uh, appreciate and through that process able to solve the suffering mental health suffering that the individual might be going through and spirituality has been able to provide not only personal meaning it provides purpose and also creates many coping ways for people in order to boost people's 
psychological resilience and onto the way of well-being. So all this plays a role when we look into the psychological into that the neglect of spirituality and this spiritual will find a very difficult way to enter into those individualistic view of psychology. Uh, also, when we look at the social sciences, there are many variabilities that are very much, uh, pertinent or useful when it comes to social context. So the norms of people that we look at it, we find that they are so variable, uh, that they are so wide, and because they are wide, those variables often some are neglected in order to be able just to provide a direction for the individual way to look at psychology. And because of that, that brings so many challenges in trying to quantify what social influences are. But when we look at it, spirituality plays its own role to try to help in this, when we look at how it affects communities, because when we look at individual, it's a product of its community. Individual lives in the community. Family is the most simplest uh, element of the society. But the individually try to reduce and reduce and reduce the individual to the individual alone, rather than looking that individual doesn't live alone, but lives in the community, from the smaller to the larger community. And spirituality helps to provide a way to see that people can appreciate what social support really are. To provide not only a sense of belonging, but that communal activity that should enhance social well-being, which are being uh, propagated these days, but are still not well integrated into the mainstream. Then looking at those missing elements from the um, understanding of mental health, do I found it the cultural aspect of it? There are a lot of cultural barriers because most of the way we understand uh, biological interpretation, psychological inter and social interpretation when it comes to mental health, are usually from a unique cultural perspectives. It is not encompassing to take other cultural perspectives into it because the mainstream approach is an interpretation of the cultural milieu of where they were developed from. And this limitation makes it difficult for people who did not come from that cultural milieu, who could find it difficult to be able to integrate itself and be able to benefit maximally from the help that is going to be uh, given. And that is why this limitation has leads to several concepts like Islamophobia and all those that we are in tune to. And we have been given one lesson about it or that to be able to appreciate the way it goes. But in the, one of the things that is also missing when the, from the uh, mainstream perspective is the spiritual aspect of it. Because it is a core of how we can appreciate the culture. Because like has been identified and has been appreciated that religion is trying, trying to bring orderliness to the world, which science is said to be, uh, to be neutral, but in essence, it's not really neutral because it's a product of the culture where it comes from. So because of that challenges to what science is now, the way we, we interpret it, it has made it to try to look at religion as if it is what anti-science, which is not so because religion, is trying to bring a word on that, uh, word or to bring orderliness to the world. And that way, the cultural milieu of how the science is being interpreted, interpreted, it should be able to integrate itself with this worldview so that it will be able to bring more peace to the world. And when we look in terms of the holistic perspective, the, the way it is being operationalized uh, in the mainstream perspective, the way uh, the framework that are given to it, find it difficult for you to be integrated and balance in the various elements of mental health that we know it. Uh, because to provide an holistic well uh, uh, treatment for, uh, let's say, a patient that presents to you or a client, to provide a holistic view, the mainstream try to minimize, to reduce some of these other elements that are vital to the individual that is presenting for treatment, because those are part of what the individual needs to be able so uh, 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 the individual needs to be able to discuss with, with the therapist, with the person trying to provide the intervention. And they be able, need to be able to find a way to integrate those individuals' concern using uh, the models that are from this very rich background in this world to be able to help the individual to get the needed support so that the individual can quickly find a way to recuperate faster and be able to integrate back into society and be able to live a meaningful, a resilient and meaningful life 
for the individual. So all this comes to work together to talk about uh, the limitations that the current approaches as we have it do bring to us. So how do we source to in order to be able to cover for this limitation? And that's bring this background that I'm trying to bring. Uh, one of it is to look at Islam's uh, cultural adaptation ability. And this has been uh, the team of the, uh, the written work by Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah of the Adnawawi Foundation in Chicago. Uh, he's an Islamic jurist and he's trying to describe what makes Islam compared to all other uh, religion, ideas, and things in the world. What makes it unique when you look at it? And because Islam has this ability to adapt to various culture in the world, irrespective of the history, irrespective of Islam, adapts to it. And because it has those central principles, those makosid, like people in the uh, in the jurisprudence will talk about the makosid, those makosid are unique and they are culturally uh, sensitive to every culture that they find themselves in. So that Islam ability gives it the uh, uniqueness. So that's why it would be a good place to source for the alternative in order to be able to fill this gap that the main stream mental health practices, uh, the way we know it, is the limited in. And this, he, he tried to uh, in, introduce this through the mental of a river. And he briefly described it as such, that Islam's adaptability is likely to a clear, life-giving river that reflects the color of its bedrock, illustrating how Islam can take on different cultural appearances. And I attributed this to its ongoing relevance and appeal across diverse culture. That's attributed this using this metaphor of a river. In the essence, we know the river provides so many things. It provides not source of drinking water for the community where the river is. It, it also provides source of food for the community. It also provides source to irrigate and so that to grow more food for the community. It also provides a way to cleanse. Because, they, 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 if, because we are not talking, we are talking of a flowing river. The river also provides to cleanse the depths of the society, which if you look at the society like the, the, in the river, as the river flows, in, which is the Islam, as it's flowing through the society, is cleansing the, all the entities that are there in the, in, uh, in the river itself. And also the rock on which the river flows on, it also shaping it, it also cleans it and shaping it so that it can be very, uh, uh, not only clean, but uh, useful for the purpose of the, that community. So the Islam fits into this. And however, there are some cautions about how this metaphor should be interpreted. Because for most people, when this metaphor is given, they are very quick to just make rhetorics to shout about it and be talking about the progress. Uh, this is why Islam is fantastic. That's not the reason why Islam is only fantastic. It is because Islam is practical. And that is why those historical uh, rhetoric, we should not put them in, in, in a vain talk. We should be able to bring it to the practicality of it. And how do we have to solve problem then? How do solve problem now? And how to be useful to solve problem in the future? We should also be careful so that we don't bring a cultural practice of Islam in one segment of, to another because it might not uniquely solve the problem of the other community. And because Islam, because in this case, we are trying to force some cultural adaptability to something else. And Islam already have its core principles. That is, those core principles will bring to the, the society. And that's the river that it comes and able to help the society to reshape itself so that it can be able to give uh, bounties, life, and great, uh, great gratefulness to that community. And it is also calls to for that. They, he talked about the importance of understanding past wisdom of Islam to continue the tradition of cultural relevance and enrichment and adapting established norms to modern situation in order to maintain Islam cultural re relevance. So the other thing that is also being looked at to serve as the sourcing, the alternative, 
is to look at the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi as narrated in both Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, uh, where it the hadith says that you will certainly follow the ways of those who come before you, and span by and span, cubits by cubits, to the extent that if they enter the hole of a lizard, you will enter it too. The companions asked, Oh, Messenger of Allah, do you need the Jews and the Christians reply, Who else? And this has been beautifully put into a theory, a model for us, in order to be able to help the Muslims, to not to be able to help that to the world that the lizard phenomenon is not only unique to the Muslim, it's also used to all cultural entities across the world, it's used to all ideologies across the world. And it's what is one is that we should be careful and cautious not to follow blind imitation of others. Another thing that is, this lizard phenomenon is talking about is to be able to provide a critical evaluation of Western intellectual and cultural models so that when we are able to look at that, we can be able to, to be sure that though we are not trying to bring a cultural hegemony to another community, but rather we are bringing the principles that will help that community to thrive. And the emphasis on the thoughtful approach to integrating external influences that align with Islamic teachings. And one of the other things also talking about the importance of intellectual independence and self-reliance among Muslims, which is very vital if you want to find what is uniquely or what is a unique solution towards the Muslim challenges or, or, go, or what the Muslims are going through that time. And lastly, it's also telling us that. To, uh, not to lose sight of one's cultural and religious heritage in the face of the globalization and the cultural hegemony that is going on. This particular uh, phenomenon has been very helpful to serve as one of the, uh, to serve as one, one of the more uh, present, uh, uh, present mental health shift to be able to usher in back the Islamic uh, uh, the, 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 the Islamic cultural heritage, what the previous predecessors have contributed to human understanding, to understanding the human mind, and to provide solution to the suffering that the human mind might go through. And this is very unique because it also helps us to see the limitation of some of those theories. For instance, psychoanalysis is more of theory. Yes, it has been applied for so many patients, but it's very difficult to carry out a research on it because it's more of theory. So it's finding it, it is difficult to bring this. So it's a more of a cultural flow of what psychosexual experience should just be, flow, flow and flow, rather than what is it that we can bring to be able to solve people's problems. So this lizard phenomenon is telling us not just to jump in and be talking about it, ego in a very reductionist view, but rather, if we need to, we need to look at what could be the way that this community will appreciate what this is, and not just to force it into people. So this lizard dome phenomenon is very vital, and we need to be careful not to enter the lizard dome. And this serves as a source to help us to now see that yes, if you don't want to enter the lizard dome, do we have what it is to present to make a change? And that ushered in the view of Islamic psychology. Of course, it has been called Islamic psychology globally, but I just feel it's for the uh, lack of more appropriate word to use, because I believe that Islamic psychology is more richer than the, the, the limited definitions or understanding of what psychology should really be. So that it just be, they will not just look at Islamic psychology, it's more richer than that. So I, I am challenging us there that it may be our challenge to see that we might come up with a more integrating maybe terminology to be able to capture the solar, to be able to give the world actually what this phenomenon is. And Islamic psychology is sourced from the Quran and the Sunnah. And because it tried to bring a balance between the spiritual, the mental, the physical, and the community aspect of human existence. The human existence is very vital. And this is because the Islam brought one of the most fundamental things to describe the human nature. And that is the future. And it's talking that the human nature is made of good. And in order to be able to help that goodness to grow, to thrive, and to continue to thrive, to flourish, then we need to be able to appreciate this. And Islamic psychology is pointing to this. 
which is what most of some of these uh, researchers in the mainstream are trying to bring about what is compassion these days, what is empathy, all these have been brought forward. But we also know their interpretation are limited because it's not looking at the, the, the religion of the middle, the way Islam tried to be the one in the center, to be able to bring balance to this. Those are not like, they are pulling people in the reductionist way to the extreme in order to just to segregate people more. And this unique integration of spirituality and morality into mental health is one of the major impetus that Islamic psychology has bring and is helping the world with. And another thing it also brings that it gives a new meaning to ethics. Because when we look at it, for instance, in the global meltdown some years ago, it's not that those people who are working in those so so called uh, uh, hybrid money uh, forecasting uh, what did it's not that they they are not ethical. They were taught ethics too. They are taught ethics about money, ethics about this. But when ethics lacks value, the individual is not likely to adopt that ethics. And Islamic psychology is bringing a value laden ethics that makes it unique from all other way of looking at ethics before. And this is one of the things that is needed in order to be able to create a professional, to create a therapist that will try his best in order to help the individual to get what is required, what is needed in a more empathic way, in a more compassionate way so that the individual can get to it. And doing this will also not only be ethical, it will also be able to provide the right community support as the pillar to what we expect mental well-being to be. And based on this sourcing that the Mesdaga guy is trying to show us essentially what role we expect Islamic psychology to play. So now, Islam being the river, but now let's look at the metaphor of the brain. Look at what the founding sciences and the missing element are contributing. Their, their, their limitation is still there, and that's why Islam is coming to, and it's sounds like the beam of light that is radiating and permeating through them in order to be able to cleanse them of all their limitations so that when it cleans them, it makes them to become more useful for the human growth, for the human experience. And the, so in order to carry the human being from the point of pain, suffering, to the point of healthiness, point of being resilient, and to thrive subsequently. And this is the unique uh, contribution that uh, Islamic psychology is expected to bring to mental health. Uh, and so this is what we, we would might call the essence of Islamic psychology. The Islamic psychology is trying to, to integrate both the existential and the mainstream psychology. It's bringing them back to find that no, there are their common grants, there are common ways to move together and they can serve humanity rather than be reductionist, rather than be parallel and going in the extreme of opposite direction, no. They are bringing, Islamic psychology is bringing them, weaving them together, but refining them as it's trying to do, just like the river metaphor, the way it refines the river, the way it refines the bed, and the, the way that is the Islamic psychology is coming to it. And that is the essence of what Islamic psychology stood for. And luckily, it has, it has a very rich heritage. It has a very rich uh, resources, which has span over 10,000 years. Because from the from if we look at well, historically what is traced by Al Balki from his treatise, which is the ninth century, compared to most of what we are understanding by which are usually a product of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century that we are in, we we'll find that Islam has a more richer heritage to help in order to bring back what it has done before that people are trying to spill apart and pull extreme to bring them and integrate them back so that to be able to serve humanity better and give the right focus for humanity to move forward. And this, um, we just bring it to one of the main contributors in the current model, which is, I'm looking at this, one of the best models for mankind, mankind, when we try to understand what Islamic psychology is building, and just to look at it from the iceberg phenomena, as uh, brought forward by uh, Dr. Abdullah Rutma. And this shows, in the typical psychology, what is usually looked at, they don't look at the depth of the human being. They look, they try to look into the unconscious, which is about 
they they find it difficult to look to go the because the, the reductionist view could not help them to look, appreciate the depth, which is where spirituality is. Because the human soul, which is what psychology traditionally is, to the study of the human soul, which is now reduced to the study of the human mind. The, that human soul is part of psychology, which has been neglected by the mainstream and the existential psychology, uh, existentialism that we do have. They've reduced them. So that makes it difficult for the human being to be able to solve his in-depth challenges, his in-depth uh, uh, troubles, the complexity of the human mind that the human needs to go to the root of it in order to be able to help himself, to be able to see, oh, let me live a more purposeful, a more balanced, and be able to appreciate the bounties of Allah, our creator, the human being. So this model serves as a model for mankind and because it looks at the depth of it, the inner depth of it is the spiritual state and not just the emotional cognition and, and which the current models are looking at. The current models are not looking at emotional cognition and how it influences behavior, but the Islamic psychology is looking at all of them and is looking beyond them. And in this way, it's helping to reform and refine the individual. And like Brother Abdullah uh, uh, once said, uh, the long time psychotherapy that we have, which is the psychoanalysis, is trying to help individuals to get to the depth of this. But because it lacks the tool, it lacks the, the, the model itself, it's limited. It cannot help the individual to get to this. So people spend a long time in therapy, but still could not address this issue at the end of the day. But the, the, this model is able to help human beings to solve the problem. And this serves as one of the uh, best models that we can present in order to help individuals to be able to navigate not only the external world, not only the internal world, but also the deeper inner recesses of both the external and the inner world so that we can be able to provide the best model, the best guide for not only Muslim but for the whole of mankind, so that the whole of mankind can thrive together and be able to achieve the purpose of creation in them. And based on this, I, I try to use it to look at the common ground, because the Islamic model, as, as I've tried to show us, is there. The Islamic psychology is there, but what is the common ground between the Islamic psychology and the mainstream? And which area can we look at to say this uh, are unique? And when we look at the founding of uh, uh, the, the founding principles, we, we will understand that the Islamic psychology uh, is unique in the sense that it brought the spiritual aspect to it so that the founding principles, when it comes to understanding the human experience, is not limited, it's not reduced in its voice. Encompassing is a big, broad, straight road. Anybody can walk any part of this broad, straight road. But everybody should be able to get what he wants and be able to thrive within it. And when it comes to uh, what well-being should be, it is focused beyond just providing a cognitive and behavioral system. It brings the holistic, the holistic itself is what Islamic psychologists try to bring to it. And when we look at values and the sensitivity that bring about it, it wants to go deeper because it provides focus on spiritual and cultural sensitivity. Of what Islamic biology, um, Islamic psychology is compared to the mainstream, and when we look at the role it plays in society and this, the the community itself, it celebrates the best of all the social form of social support, which is the extended uh, the extended family system, which the individualist society did not. The individualist society reduced people to that, but the collective society. And that's why Islam, which produces and celebrates the extended family, and it has been found that the presence of the extended family in people's life provides support from three generations of people. And this is, it can provide for more than three generations, depending on what the dynamics in the extended family. But at least it provides gen support from three generations, rather than just limited support that the current mainstream are giving and looking at it. And what are the preventive measures that we can get from this? And it's look at prevention all across for the human being. The mainstream also look at it. So they share a lot of things in this preventive measure. But it emphasizes more values that 
will be able to help people even before the event happen. So this this is this is like before we plan conception itself and then preventive measures to take into place. Which Islamic psychology look at it, which you know when they come to the issue of tarbiyah, emphasis is always based on before you marry. What are you looking for? So all those things are there, which is one of the uniqueness of Islamic psychology. And it provides way for people to cope and to grow and become resilient. And Islamic psychology cherish and celebrate people's faith. It did not look at it just as a simplistic tool for people to have no. It look at it as a tool which in itself promotes well-being, bring the spirituality, and not just to say, I don't have religion, but I'm growing spiritually. This kind of growth is very limited and it's not going to bring the depth of what the model of Islamic psychology has brought for humanity to be able to see. And when it comes to ethics, which I've emphasized, Islamic will bring the value into the ethics, which the current model did not have. And uh, cultural adaptation, which I've talked about this over and over, and does it have the potential to address modern challenges? Yes, it does because it can benefit from this deep-rooted traditional wisdom so that it can provide that to also help the current and also the future, which the contemporary method is only when they bedevil with it, then it's it started dropping. What can I do? How can I use this to solve the Islamic have this rich heritage, helps it to be well and better equipped to be able to solve the contemporary challenges. So just to provide more, uh, about what I've been trying to talk about is that the clinical utility of Islamic psychology worldwide, that it is the main paradigm that bring about metaphysical and transcendental dimensions of well-being. Because it talks about issue before birth. It talks about issue during conception. It talks about issues after birth. And, and from birth to that the intra life it discuss all the issues that are there. It discuss the issue and look at about it. And in death, it talk about the issue of death itself, the thanatos. And 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 then beyond beyond death, it talked about the issue and the consequences that lies through all this. So that's why the Islamic psychology is more richer, more deeper compared to the mainstream approach. And that's why it starts at one of the best to be able to provide the, the essence of the psychology, the, as we know it, so that to be able to enrich it and bring more benefit to human beings. And in this, in trying to do this, it that to help us appreciate that in order to live the test of life, we should be able to appreciate it as a barrier. Because it is when we, it's also bringing coping for people as the test of life is coming. It's bringing coping, it's bringing relief, and it's also bringing healing for it on the, on, in the way to, and it's also telling us that, that when we look at the test of light too, we can also see that humanity is their presence to, and the conscience of humanity should be brought forth, which is like uh, when this program started, we are talking about the suffering that humanity is going through in the Gaza region. And this is telling us that if we want to live the test of humanity, that conscience must be brought. And uh, we pray that Allah will I think the conscious of the whole world, I think the conscious of the aggressors, so that they will be able to appreciate the value of human life, that no one human life is better than the other, but they are all there to serve the purpose of creation, and they should be able to allow, allow peace to reign. And that is also talking about the best way to live, so that when we die, we can be able to have the best way out of it. And ultimately, it's guiding us that our deeds is the mirror of all the experiments that our life experience is. So because deeds is very vital, and it is these deeds that tell, that brings the richness, the depth of human essence, the depth of human living, the depth of it, it brings it to the fore for people to be able to appreciate. And also, apart from bringing the metaphysical aspect of well-being as a clinical utility we can do when we are with our uh, people who are seeking help from us, it's also telling us that it's sourcing new, it's sourcing the best model when we talk about how we can appreciate health and disease paradigms, health and disease models, and how to bring about holistic healthcare. It's the one that have the source, it's the one that have practiced it, 
and it's the one that can give us this. So it has this clinical utility globally, worldwide. And because it's very flexible, which is what it provides in the metaphor, like I mentioned earlier about the river, the Islamic cultural adaptation, is able to, well, to offer a comprehensive view of what mental health is and what it should be. And this way, it's also stretching best practice of holistic mental health because it did not only bring ethics, it brings value integrated with the ethics so, so that we can serve women better that way. In summary, uh, I've tried to help us see that uh, Islamic psychology is the balanced river of mental health. Uh, that as that balance, it provides a unique holistic approach to mental well-being. It shared a common ground with the mainstream psychology, but it's more encompassing for being culturally sensitive, flexible, and it's adaptable to embrace all the community and extended family system. And most important, it promotes mental health rooted in value-laden ethical consideration. So I will conclude by saying that uh, Islamic psychology presents a compressive approach that effectively blends spiritual, psychological, physical, community, values, ethics, culture, and the holistic view of health, the holistic model, to align with the evolving needs of the global mental health practice, both now and inshallah in the future. Uh, these are just some brief recommendations I want to make, hoping that this will may guide us further, just to look at the, one of these things, look at the broader integration and reconceptualization, because Islamic psychology, like I've said, we need to give it a broader uh, uh, understanding. We need to give it a broader uh, advocacy to the world. And we need to be able to reconceptualize it in terms of the terminology itself, if you can find a better way to reconceptualize the terminology, so that this will help people to be able to appreciate it and be able to see that this is what it brings and it's going to bring more healing to the world and the better healing to the world. We also need more research and development and thanks to the group who are working globally to see that more research has been done in this. Of course, one of them is uh, uh, by Dr. Rania and their working group. The Yakin Institute is there and the other group globally, the IC, uh, IC group is there and the research that partner with the uh, IC group are there. So all, everyone is working. And this research are vital because it did not only show that it's, it is not working, but it's also showing that it continues to work. And it's also showing the value of it in the current appreciation of the uh, human experience. And being an innovative model is going to bring more innovative service that is going to help to serve and fit and help to revolutionize the current limitation of the mainstream and be able to help humanity to live a more better life and bring more peace to the world, which is the psychology of peace and able to bring that. Of course, to achieve this, we need more training and more education. And the leaders in it are already there. And we are grateful to them because many courses have come up by Islamic psychology, more as they growing globally. And we are looking at it, that we'll be able to benefit more from this so that we students can learn more and be able to help people that we need it to grow with it. Of course, it also have global reach and translation effort that needs to be made because when these are produced in one language, we need to be able to have people that will translate it for value so that people in other languages can benefit from are able to use it. In Nigeria too, we need more people to be able to translate it to the various local languages in Nigeria so that the various people who are there in the country can utilize the wealth of benefits that Islamic psychology is bringing. Um, based on this, we should do more community outreach and be able to do more advocacy, especially in order to be able to help formulate policy that is going to help globally and uh, locally for us too. So at this point, I want to thank uh, the organizers, to thank uh, everyone that participated and be patient all along, and to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this possible, feasible, and the reality. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan. This is uh, wonderful. And I believe you like agree with me. Everyone that is attending and watching can attend to this. I really appreciate the depth of uh, references and approaches you've uh, 
kind of bring it, make it more colorful and uh, may Allah reward you for your efforts. And we look forward to more of your efforts in the Nigerian context as well. You know, we want someone of your caliber to play more role. Of course, we're going to work together in future. We hope sure. so. Sure. And one of the reasons you meet, you ref, and I mean, Dr. Malik Badris, Lizard's old phenomenon. We've been looking, we have been looking for a way to review some of his books because it's very vital. I mean, as a part of the awareness, and I believe that you will be available to, to do that with us in future, I believe. I'm trying to push that to you now. <laughs> will you be available for when we well, inshallah, we we'll, we'll all play our role. But I also know there is an institute in Kano that Professor Salis to share with the International Institute of Islamic Thought. I'm sure the one of our advisors. was the one that gave so, the first. Yes, I, I, yes, I, yes, I. Uh, so I'm delighted. I really appreciate your lecture. I just want to be brief uh, of what are uh, the take homes there, which is uh, existentialism, that is in the mainstream. And you have tried to say that this is actually the philosophy of your So we can say that existentialism is also just, uh, Islam is just one of those methods. If you have to say, we expect about spirituality, the other religions, uh, the Indians have their own religion. Uh, and the Chinese and all that. It's, they have their own philosophy they are bringing to the table, but we have been able to say that Islam has a, a kind of purpose. Of course, because we believe that... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's come around. Come around. We are, it has been proven that what we have, the purpose that uh, Islam is what Allah has brought to us, and that's the main guidance. As you have said in one of the uh, meaning, what is missing? People are giving individualistic meaning to things, uh, which has made it limit the, the solution they are providing in mainstream. Uh, so, and also you talk about the, the, the nature of human being, uh, how they have been treating human beings. You know, when you talk about the egos and all of these things, and to be honest, these are some of the things that um, the phenomenon that we are into. <laughs> we just say, okay, personality, this is how I look like, these are things are. And we forget, maybe uh, out of, um, uh, I don't know how, how to put it, we just forget that we have another meaning to all of these things, whereby these things are also going to work together. Not as well to push them away, their meaning, but beyond that, it can change when it comes to the spirituality and how Allah has interpreted some of these things to us. So I, I hope that uh, Islam, I know there's a lot of, uh, work to be done no doubt uh trying to bring in islamic approach and uh one important thing you said about um uh islamic psychology to to give a different meaning to it i mean the definition to it um, it's it might be difficult uh yes we can give a different definition but meaning in the sense that when you look at islam we have like you 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 also mentioned uh usul fiqh the the essence, the makos, the sharia, and all of this, they are vital and important when it comes to the discussion of uh, how to interpret human being, the essence of human being, all of this. So uh, I, I agree with you that I, we need a different approach as to how we want the mainstream to, I mean, the mainstream researchers to welcome Islamic psychology. Of course, I believe that if we get to work and we do our diligent work, they're, they're definitely going to approach uh, and accept, uh, accept it. Just like uh, like the issues of NLP that uh, they will say is not part of pseudoscience and all of this, but yet they see that it's working in a way and they just have to uh, agree with it. So um, at this point, I will want to ask a few questions. Um, I don't know if anybody has a question. I can just give like... Uh, seconds to see if we have any questions we can raise up your hand before going ahead with the questions that i have with me so please if you have a question you can put them in the chat button uh, chat box and or you just you raise your hand to with the icon button. thank you so Okay. Um uh, well, salam. Please go ahead. Yeah. Salam alaikum to Larakat. 
Maybe it sounds a lot better. Now, my lamp, please. Thank you for the good job. My voice and, sounds very uh, good. The speaker as well, Dr. Tajuddin. We appreciate your in-depth uh, knowledge and uh, the lesson that you've taught every one of us today. I just want to implore the organizers that uh, please subsequently um, we should try to make uh, more publicity about uh, the programs and what we are doing. We should try as much as possible to let it reflect in other social media as well. If not that uh, Dr. Ishola posted it to the platform in which I was and immediately I saw it and I went through it, I had to log out of a particular program to join this one. So mm -hmm. I think uh, a scholastic something like this needs to be, you know, given a widespread. May Allah make it easy for every one of us. as Okay, now. Well, I appreciate it. Inshallah, we'll do more on that. Uh, we are looking forward to more volunteers to, to raise more awareness now. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, my name is uh, Yunus Yehuda. I'm, I'm from Kano State. I'm a student of uh, mental health. I'm a student of uh, geography. That okay. is uh, medical geography. Mm. And I'm currently writing on anxiety and depression. And I have um, learned a lot from the presentation. And I'm looking forward to also join the team. That's the WhatsApp group and other uh, medium where I can be starting a lot of knowledge from the um uh, I'm sharing the, the, the psychology at rally. I really appreciate and I really learn a lot of uh, concepts from what the presenter just presented. Uh, I really appreciate and uh, thank you. I want to thank the organizers as well. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to see you in the group. You can just join. I just send the link now. So any other person. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have any other questions? Or, or I would like to go ahead now with the questions that I have with me. Uh, so, okay, so okay, so I think I already mentioned this. What I wanted to ask is um, what are the other examples or alternatives that you can say? You talk about uh, Hello. Excuse me, sorry, I'm back, I'm back, sorry. Um, can we get this, uh, the presentation? No, no, if you join it? the uh, WhatsApp, before now we are okay. not able to send emails, but if you join the WhatsApp group, you can request and to be sent to you. Inshallah. Thank you very much, I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much, thank you very much. So I want to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Abiola, how have you been able to practice these approaches in your your day-to-day -day practice, uh, maybe privately or even the mainstream, aside the fact that you're trying to raise awareness and try to get people to understand this, uh, what Islam psychology can offer. So I want you to tell us how you have been able to do that in your small, your little way. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you once again. Of course, to practice this, it entails uh, first for one to even uh, be able to appreciate the the way the requisites understand the or knowledge. So okay, I can practice. Uh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Please go ahead. Sorry, I was. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I, 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 what I'm trying to say is that for one to practice first is what must have been qualified to even have access to patient to be able to help patient. So that mm -hmm. if one have that access, that means one is already providing some level of care. So it is one ability to provide some level of care that that's when one will face the challenges of patient when they come. Uh, for instance, one of the things that drives generally to psychology is this, uh, that some patient will be writing antidepressant for. The patient is stable, but the patient keeps coming to clinic and I keep wondering, what, is, what more can we do for this individual? And I ask, are you ever happy? He said, I'm not happy. I felt okay, but I'm still not happy. 
And I realized that the medication have done a lot for this person to help the person's depression. But the person have not still learned what it means to go further. And that is one of the things that pushed me to learn about psychotherapy. Of course, learning psychotherapy is very tricky because one will read so many theories, but when it comes to practicality, is uh, which of these do you really have the practical ability to do something about? And uh, which one of the things that I've done so many listen to do is uh, cognitive behavior therapy. And also when I'm doing my master, I, I was able to have more experience with uh, existentialism too. In the, so this gives me some appreciation of what this uh, entails. Uh, but coming back to the question that I've been able to integrate this is, I have to be able to first identify what these people's challenge were. For instance, uh, one of the early set of people I've met, I'm trying to teach them relaxation. And teaching them, it looks like a joke to them because they look, is this what you teach me? Trying to teach them one of the simplest, which is what deep breathing. So is this what you teach me? But I have to find a way to, for them to practice it. Because without practicing, it's difficult to use when you do their needs. So one of the ways uh, we were able to resolve the issue is to link it to their daily prayers. Mm -hmm. so, okay, you pray five times a day. Okay, fine. After every prayer, then do this as part of your ask. You do your ask, but you practice this too in the process. For those that have felt, oh, no, this, okay, let's use your ask to practice deep breathing. Mm -hmm. So the, this, this is one of the way I'm able to use this to help the people that I've seen. Of course, there are more in-depth issues than that. For instance, there are people who will come with, uh, in the process of seeing some other patients, there are those that have what we call a spiritual distress, uh, which is a diagnosis there. There are those that have spiritual distress. And when it comes, of course, being the mental health, what you usually look at is, I know this is not true. Just give medication. This should go away. But it did not go away. And also understand the CPT psychosis. Now, okay, this is psychotic. For some people, it may be psychosis because the belief is just odd. For the, the way they bring about the belief, even when it's in the religious context, it's just odd. So for them, it's a big trouble. So without understanding spirituality, it becomes difficult to be able to help those people. Uh, one of such patients that we have seen is, from the main perspective, he just he says spirituality is to have a sense of purpose and meaning in life by definition. That, that's from the mainstream. But applying it becomes difficult. How do you go about trying to give somebody a sense of purpose and meaning? Because purpose is more bigger than meaning itself. So how to help people to do this becomes very difficult. But one of the things that helped me is Islamic psychology itself, because it is able to give what are the two pillars of spirituality. And it gives two pillars of spirituality. One is the belief itself, which is what most people thought spirituality is. No, but also give the other pillar of it which is what? Self-care. And self-care is what we are trying to help patients to achieve. So we try to help patients to get that self-care so that when the person is taking care of himself, then it becomes easier to address the spiritual trouble that the individual is going through. Of course, depending on the depth of what the person might need, we determine what, that, what we will do. And at times we might need to call for, uh, to refer to some scholars in the community. But we don't refer to all scholars because not all scholars appreciate what we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. We have to look for the right scholar who really understand what this is and why they need to work. It's not just to tell the person, no, don't go, don't do this. This is yeah, you know, some of those myths that might be promoted also by some of the scholars. That is a sign of weakness if you are depressed, which we know is not true. Hey, there are many stories from the Sira. There are many stories that we know in Islamic history, and we know these are not true. People have been depressed, they get help, and they get over it. And so learning all this, I find a way to, to find some of the use. Uh, another thing we also do, is just like the, the Askar that we do, we know it has a value, but we try to help people appreciate what is the meaning of that Askar you are doing. So when people appreciate the meaning, it now help them to be able oh, to see the purpose of doing it. So some people just think, and they don't say I should do it. Let me just do it. Uh, I have done this. No. If you don't value the meaning of what you are doing, it can also be difficult for the person to benefit from what he's doing. And also the approach that people do it might also matters. 
Some people just say, I want to do 1,000 this, and they just go. The meaning is lost. The sense, so the person is just become a process of just, just doing something. Of course, they get some benefit, but it did not bring the holistic benefit that it, it should bring. So it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to also be very uh, limited in what I'm trying to say so that I don't use it just to diverge to another topic for what you're discussing. But the we put Islamic psychology into practice have been very helpful, especially for my patient. I, I practice in the northern part of the country. And mm. of course, I will see a large number of people more who are Muslims and who will need these interventions. And this has been very helpful for me because it depends on the way they present their help. I've also seen people who are non-Muslims but my understanding of Islamic psychology has been able to help me to help them to understand their own faith. So that, that way it helped them to appreciate their faith and be able to move forward. For instance, uh, of course, this is not, but there was a time we, we like in drug, uh, people who have drug uh, challenges, drug addiction problem. Uh, this person is addicted to alcohol. And when we come, they say, look, it's your faith that says you should not drink alcohol. My faith said this. I said, tell me where your faith said. He said, no, the first miracle of Jesus Christ is to turn water to wine. <laughs> I said, okay, fine. If you turn water to wine, then bring water, turn it to wine yourself and drink. But if you cannot turn water to wine, don't drink the wine you're saying. Because the wine you're doing is not what Jesus Christ, the miracle of Jesus Christ. And that helped the person to look at, oh, I make a lot of mistakes. Because I'm trying to put a square peg in a round hole. So this also helps to be able to help the individual to be able to see the fallacy that they might make in their thinking process in order to be able to find a very cheap way to justify what they are doing and to give it a religious coloration. Mm. Also, we, we have some people that when we are talking with them, that it is their religion that helps us to be able to get them to do what we want them to do. For instance, the concept we call behavioral activation, which is like the behavioral part of CBT. But it be able to actually stand on its own too as a therapy because it's, it's one of the evidence-supported therapy that people can do. You just forget about the cognitive aspect. That we want people to do some certain things, but they, they fail to appreciate it. So we have to use their religion. You have to use the religion to tell them, okay, this story in your religion say that people do this. They did not just sit here and get this. They, to move from A to B, they, there's an activity that takes place between A to B. So if you are not ready to practice, then you are not going to get to B. So don't expect that it's just a miracle that it must happen. So it, it, it has helped for me to be able to, this, this understanding, for me, it has found use for both Muslim and non-Muslims. So we, we, and that's this, that's what I'm just trying to bring forward based on my practice experience. I appreciate that. So because what I understand now is that on one hand, a professional should have a substantial knowledge in of Islam, yes. understand his own Islam, so that he can help others. So the coloration that you have, you can help, you can assist your patient, whether he is a Muslim or a Christian or other faiths, because you have you already have the approaches you want to use and then you can assist them with it well that can also be a form of dawa in a way because at some point when maybe they don't believe in god and you you let them know that this is how you can link it together like you emphasize in spirituality let me just uh read out one question uh brother ibn yakub can you can you speak out if, if you are if, if you can do that otherwise i will read your, your question brother ibn yakub al Nigeria. Okay, so I'll just quickly read this question and we have two people to contribute, uh, inshallah. Um, one of our organizers have asked me to call out Dr. Okpewi to contribute to this discussion. But I will quickly read out this question and then we can go ahead with that. So Brother Ibn Yaqub said, thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Abiola. I'm a resident doctor in the Department of Psychiatry at AKTH. I don't know the full meaning of AKTH. Maybe, maybe I'm in the Kano Teaching Hospital. Oh, okay, good. I'm aware of your I'm legacy. Kano Teaching Hospital, yeah. Okay, mashallah. I'll be training from that position. I really commend you, mashallah. 
my question is how do we delineate mental mental illness from what's commonly called possession by the genes that's clearly in our environment thank you very much sir. do you understand the question uh, <laughs> <Salam> alaikum. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course it is it's a tricky question be, 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 because there are those uh, intersections that do happen because there are mental illness that looks like possession, which are normal possession. And when we do what you do as a mental health expert, you, they get well. But there are also possessions which we know and it, it occurs on its own and it also needs its own intervention. So I would distinguish them is we, we have criteria that we use also. Of course, when we say somebody is depressed, there are criteria that help us to arrive at that. We did not just look at the person and just say, we take so many questions. We interact with the person. We interact with people that know the person. And all these are data we collected that we put together that help us to be able to give, uh, that we put together to be able to say, this is what this individual. So, Mental illness are guided by those, uh, I'm going to put it like uh, criteria. They are like landmarks that we look at. And that's why when we look, mental illness is just two words, but there are many, many different types of mental illness. So it depends. And that's when we look at people, we're able to use that to help us to appreciate that, okay, this is the type of mental illness this person is. This one might be having depression. This one might be having psychosis, which one of them might be schizophrenia, this one might be having anxiety disorder, which might likely be generalized anxiety disorder, just like that. So those criteria are there that guides, that help us to be able to contextualize and put it that way. This individual is suffering from mental illness. Of course, possession, now you, if you want to look at it from the mental illness perspective, if the person meets those criteria, we, we call the mental illness the person and we treat that. Uh, but possession from a perspective, from the traditional religious perspective, can be challenging. For instance, uh, of course, time, but let me just tell you, uh, in Kano, of course, I practiced in Kano before too. Uh, in Kano, there are some people brought, this individual is having psychosis. And psychosis means that the individual is having one of those illness that has lost touch, sense of touch with reality. So this individual will be saying words that did not uh, it's not reasonable when other people look at it. For instance, the person can be saying, oh, I'm God, I'm God, I'm the father of God, or I've given back to 2,000 children, I'm the mother of all this. So those kind of talk, those kind of beliefs that people bring, they are hot. So it falls into something like that, just to illustrate that. But when this person had the illness, he was taken to one of those traditional healers, it's so-called Islamic Islamic ila, in quotes. And what this person does is that he only use, he cane them. Anytime they come, he bring out a big, long wipe and he beat them up. And one of the other things they also does is that he buy one of our medication, which we call clopromazine. They will grind it, put it in water, and say they pray to the water, drink. And the way we know this thing, drug can make somebody to sleep. But the person, the patient will drink and he will sleep on. He say, "Look, I've did something." So when those people were there, they are not having possession, but they were called. They were put in court that this person is having possession. And so the person never gets well until finally they have to come to the hospital. So those are part of the challenge that to know what exactly do these people mean by possession and what does he refer to. Another example is somebody who is having seizure disorders. And the person go and they say, no, it's one of the genes that wants to marry you. And because you are beautiful, you refuse to marry the gene, that's why you have sexual disorders. Which in the, uh, there are many they call husband of the night, so many names given to it by other religious groups, like that. But in the process, this person just have seizure. And when we place the person on medication for seizure, the seizure stops. So at times it becomes a very difficult to know exactly what people mean by possession the way people who call it possession, because it might actually be mental illness. But when it comes to the possessive states, the rookie will become valuable, will become tenable. And we don't shy away from it if we're able to arrive at that stage and say, let's call the right people to do this. But we also want those people to do it in an LD way, 
not in an unhealthy way that it involves violence, it involves flogging. No, that's no longer treatment. That's more like punishment. That, that's just brief, I will say there. I hope this helps. Thank you. I'm sure Dr. Pewe, when he will talk, he will say more. Dr. Pewe is my colleague <laughs> and uh, a very good uh, brother and friend. We are once together in Kanoji. <laughs> Thank you so much. We hope to have you on the platform one day, inshallah. I will, I will right, inshallah. 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 You're good to write up, inshallah. Brother Zach. So let Dr. Ibrahim just uh, give his contribution and you, you round up the program, inshallah. Dr. Ibrahim, please go ahead. I think you are trying to unmute. Ah, yes, I can. You can hear me. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Am I audible enough? Yes. Yes. Very well. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. So, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa ala um, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, meeting. This is my first time of I've uh, attempted to be part of it some times ago, but allow uh, not permit me. Secondly, uh, I'm very grateful and thankful to God to be able to listen to our dear lecturer. Do I miss most part of his lecture due to connection problems? Uh, I know uh, he, he, he has uh, done justice to the topic. So I appreciate him very well. He's my senior colleague, don't mind him. He's one of those people that uh, motivate us on this path. Uh, I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I am in Ogun State now at Federal Medical Center at Bekuta. That's where I'm practicing. Um, for is to. Okay, sorry, somebody is trying to disturb me, to disturb me here. So we are said the the delineating between the two professional, but let me say that uh, to be concerned about mental health issues and uh, you know game possession. I think you're, you're just... it's because the lot of errors, the lot of even evils perpetrated due to ignorance of our malam side of of this thing, and they don't know the other side. So we as Muslims who are trained in orthodox manner, and we are also Muslim, we have the cause to believe in the existence in the reality of possession by genes. So we must really be concerned and be interested in this. Uh, there are actually cases of purely gene possessions that will present with psychiatric conditions, with symptoms, hallucinatory behavior, experiences, even delusions, and what have you. So in such a case, it will be a serious issue even for the psychiatrist. But like my brother has said, in orthodox psychiatric practices, there are criteria for you to make diagnosis. So when you have applied all those criteria and you seem not to, you know, seeing or getting to a particular diagnosis, you may you may begin to suspect that this may not actually be a, a pure or a psychiatric condition rather presenting like psychiatric conditions. And uh, that's the one of the, then the other thing is that when you have treated 
I mean, make diagnosis, review diagnosis after six weeks. You have treated after another six weeks, and it appears you are not getting results. You can also begin to suspect this may be more than you know physical. And in such situations, what we do where I practice is to invite trustworthy, knowledgeable alarm that knows some things about orthodox, you know, medical practice or say psychiatric practice to, you know, to receive. And then that person will be able to give us an opinion. And usually when there's a gym possession, when those malam see and recite the ayat of the Quran to Rukia, they will usually know because Rukia serves two purposes. Purpose it has it serves investigative purposes and it also serves as a treatment. So most of the of the time they will get to know that okay, there are reasons to believe this is due to gym possession. And it I think we lost him, but uh, we're able to get a you know, hello. So, how are you? Hello, 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 Exist. We as Muslim et, uh, mental health professional, we cannot deny it. But at the same time, we have to act as guiding light to our malams, who most of the time ignorantly call what is purely psychiatric condition gene possession, and also go for all sorts of treatment that are not really, you know. Really, uh, not humane. So we pray to Allah to guide us. Uh, by and like, I'm very appreciative of the lecture delivered by our dear brother, and I'm glad to be part of this uh, webinar this evening. We pray to Allah to guide us and make all better Muslims and help us in our uh, professional endeavors to be able to assist the cause of Islam. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm extending invitation to you now. Inshallah, I'm going to get in touch with you to expand, to expand our network and to see how you have to contribute to the awareness. Inshallah. So, Dr. Ibrahim, get ready. Okay, I will have to go ahead. And uh, 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 this, uh, your contribution is to please conclude the event. I'm going to close the presentation. So, maybe the next um, uh, four to five. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, let me begin this way. Let me appreciate uh, Dr. Abiola for his um, wonderful presentation. And I want to believe that, and I, I know that people will agree with me that he has been able to do justice, you know, to the present to the topic at hand. And as a way of contributing to the topic, I'm just reflecting, you know, about the topic and also to be realistic with some certain things. You know, in line with uh, with my present location, I'm trying to reflect about the spirituality aspect of um, Islamic um, psychology, and at the same time, I'm considering the cross cultural psychology in this aspect because I do know that the cultures of people have a way of influencing their spirituality in a way, and I'm going to cite cite an example of that. Let me let me go through the continent. At in Africa, I think we are more spiritual compared to the Europeans, you know, who are no more, who are not that you know spiritual in nature. Because compared that to, to the Asia continent also, who are kind of you know spiritual also. But my reflection is that how can we incorporate you know, Islamic psychology to other continents who are not so much you know, spiritual in nature? And in some of these continents, especially in, in Europe, 
we have some people who are you know agonistic who don't believe or who don't believe in God, so to say. So the issue of spirituality doesn't come in at all. You don't talk about you know spirituality with them because in the first place they don't believe in God. So in such a situation, can we how can we incorporate you know Islamic psychology to this kind of environment? For example, I was trying to you know interact with uh, one of my colleagues at work in recent time, and we got to the point of speaking about religion, and he made me to understand that don't go there. We don't talk about religion here. I'm an agonist. I don't believe in God. Just leave that, you know, aside. So as a practitioner psychologist, who knows that the challenges that this particular client may be having may be linked to their, you know, lack of spirituality in a way. And yeah, you have to respect people's opinion. You have to respect people's belief. And you have to appreciate them for what they believe in. You don't cross that line by trying to like force your own belief on them. And even in practice, in Cape, you know, going through the Cape, Cape plan, they must have said that, oh, this particular resident doesn't believe in God. These are things that you should do for them and all that. So maybe, let me say, as a form of question to Dr. Biola, in this case, and in addition to that, we know that anything you know, Islam kind of to penetrate people in Europe here may be very difficult because of the Islamophobia. So, in that instance, what can we do, or what will we say, you know, to this? Maybe your remarks, or in a way of answering that question we be a concluding part of this uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Sir. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to portray, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I've seen people uh, are agnostic to, uh, I've met them in the process of offering service. I've known a few of them as colleagues. I mean, we just meet at conference where we, we meet. And uh, of course, that, that they don't believe in the religion doesn't mean they don't believe in spirituality. So that, that, that's the challenge. Uh, and that is part of the sobu trying to understand what's the, what does this entail. In the, in the mainstream, in the mainstream, they separate the two. They separate religion from spirituality. And because they separated the two, they make it look that, yeah, people can become spiritual without being religious. So that, that was brought forward. But we know for most religion, they don't separate the two. They, they see the two as one. They know they are different, but they see the two as one for most religion. But Islam helps us appreciate that it's even more than that. And that's why you talk about a different level of the souls, isn't it? So you try to look at the spirituality in Islam is deeper than just the religious practice. So uh, coming from the mainstream, for such kind of people, yeah, since they are not religious, we don't talk about religion, but because they are spiritual, they can bring the mainstream understanding of spirituality up to discuss with them. Because some of them too do have spiritual crisis. They do have, they don't want to hear religion, but they still need help. So understanding this is going to help you to be able to deal with it. And that's why I've given you one of the basic things you can do. That those two pillars of spirituality are very important. Yeah, they are from the religious uh, Muslim perspective, but they are very important because you, when you talk of belief, every human being has belief that the person doesn't believe in God, but he believes in the universe. For example, so you see, a tie his belief to something. Even if you say he doesn't believe, he tied the belief to something, or he tied the belief to his brain. That is because I'm intelligent, my brain is this, so he ties it tied to that, and it limits it to that. So it's still tied to something. 
even if he doesn't believe in Allah, in the spiritual being, hmm? if he doesn't do that. So the belief is there. But like I said, you can always start from the point that is less complex, from the point of self-care. You help the individual to take care of himself, to grow. Then it allows you to process this more complex nuance when it comes to spirituality. It helps them. So coming to Islam to help with that model, let's say the universal model, if you look at it, it's talking about the rule, the depth of it. It's talking about that from that model that I uh, presented, the one given to us there by uh, Brother Abdullah uh, Rotman and colleague. And that, that model is, is unique that uh, it is unique in the sense that it look at the spiritual state of human being. That once you are able to help with the self care, yeah, you can help the individuals to start looking at the depth of spirituality. And for us as Muslim, those depth of spirituality, we we also look at things like uh, when we talk about some spirit that the highest of it, we say the words with hmm? when, when we talk at, at that highest level. And when you take on North Lawama, and all, all those levels, they, they, they have value for us. So it, it's for us that when we want to deal with this kind of person, we, we present it to them. We don't tell, we, we let them know, of course, this from a little about look at it if it can benefit you. Because to help the person to grow, then he wants to grow. You have to give him a way to grow. So to help him with that, he, so you provide that for him. You are, you are not imposing, but it is with his permission that you can present that way. All the people I've seen this context is the same thing. Like I've said that I'm forced to know some part of the other religion so that I can help them deal with their spiritual crisis. And I've cited some of those examples. Just I just try to bring the periphery so that I don't bring complexity and confusion in the, in the listing. But I, I, I've seen those people that when we are with them, we have to help them navigate that. Because if I start talking of the complex, some patient might know that I'm discussing there. <laughs> and that's an, an ethical challenge. Because it's difficult. I can say it, you don't know them. But when they hear it, they will know, okay, it's me you are referring to. And that can be an ethical issue. So it is, it is just challenge that. That's why I'll be careful not to talk much about uh, those areas. But what I'm bringing forward that we meet ethics. Yes, we meet them. They're agnostic. But we, once they come for us to help, we give them help. And we guide them and we let them know, okay, for this level, I have helped you to this. You want to learn more, okay, I will use this approach. I'm not saying you should become a Muslim. No, that's not the point now. It's you that you need to get well, but this approach can help you to get it. For instance, people use the Buddhist approach when they call talk of uh, mindfulness. mindfulness. They didn't say, yeah, they didn't say because they want to become a Buddhist. People mm -hmm. practice it. And that word is a very pregnant word. Because they only brought from the Buddhist perspective. There is Islamic perspective of mindfulness that many people are not even aware of. They don't even know Islam has it. So, mm -hmm. so there's a way certain things were called to divert people's attention away that people, when we even thought other people don't know or have any understanding of this. So it is for us to be, we are clear enough and we will help them to appreciate this. It, you want to go deeper? That this is the approach. When you are ready, we'll go through this way. If you are not ready, we'll stop at the level you are comfortable with, and we'll leave it at the end. That you are ready, we can move forward. So that 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 is the simplest thing I'm able to say for now. I, of course, I'm also learning more, and I'm sure by the time I learn more from the scholars and the the teachers, I'll be able to maybe next time be able to provide more help on this. Thank you so much. My apology. My the my system, I don't know why it's not displaying me. <laughs> I put on the video, but it's just not showing. So maybe something is wrong with my camera. I don't know. I know <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <Akbar. laughs> yeah. So on a, on so a final much. note, I think um for yeah. us also, like you made mention of that, you know, mindfulness is an extract from the you know Buddhism perspective. I I know that you know from Islam Islamic perspective also or Islamic psychology also, we can also coin a particular terminology that will be kind of neutral 
from you know from like or having a, to, an intonation of Islam. But whatever we'll be doing inside will still be embedded based on Islamic teachings and ethics. Yeah. So no. It's just like uh, like the banking system. Like Islam has a lot of solutions, but you don't have to say it's not a bank. They say non interesting banking, but they are using yeah, their products. You get it. So it's a yeah. challenge to the This is a we shall get there. <laughs> So, please, can you close the meeting so that we can just end? We're already way beyond the schedule, so we'd like to end the meeting. I would like you to just give a closing remark so that we can close the meeting. Now, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu wa Salam ala Rasulullah. Uh, let me appreciate uh, our guest speaker once again, Dr. Abiola, for your erudite um, presentation and for your scholastic um, presentation. I really appreciate you for honoring us as um, ISIP. May Mighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you abundantly. And also for, to Dr. Mm -hmm. Pewe also, I uh, appreciate you for your contribution. May Mighty Allah also reward you. And to our moderator, for mm -hmm. the it is only Mighty Allah that can reward you for the wonderful mm -hmm. job that you are doing, for you know spending your time, to ensure that all these things are put in, in place. Uh, I say Jazakumullah khairan to you. We might say Allah reward you. And also to other members of um, ISIP, Nigeria and um, Africa and all over the world, we beseech you might Allah to continue to be with each and every one of us. And we might Allah continue to reward you all. And to all participants who have participated in this uh, program, I say Jazakum la Khairan for spending your time with us. And we want each and every one of you to, 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 to be a um, partaker in this project. So we want you to help us to be spread, you know, spreading this um, program to the nooks and crannies you know, of every, every platform that you belong to so that by our next program, we can have more and more, and more people to participate. So Jazakum like her. And on this note, I'm going to bring this program you know, to an end. So when I call Huma Bihamdik, I shall allow you to answer. What's the Gafuka? What's the Gulay? What's the Salam Alikum or Rahmatullah? He will go to Katu. Alikum Salam.